There we go. Hello. Welcome back. Here we go. My mic on? Yes. Good to see you. So I'm, I'm trying to work my way around this room. I don't like this big demo table, which they like because it's really good for physics, but it made this horrid barrier between me and you on Tuesday, and I was terribly depressed by the end of class. So, so this is my try for today to see if this works. If it doesn't work, I may try to see if I can get us a room in Dwinell or 145 Dwinell or 10 Evans. So we'll see. I'm working on it, trying to make it better for me, and then therefore for you. All right, there's our topics for today. Uh, we're going to start with that framework of economic growth and the solo growth model. Uh, apply some of the concepts of productivity growth to a couple of historical examples. Uh, present to you a model that those of you who had me for 100B have seen, which is the how to critique arguments, the five step method, um, which you will use over and over and over. Uh, a little bit about pre-colonial economic activity and then some applications to games and trade. So, lots to do, an hour and 20 minutes to do it in. I'm ready to rock and roll. Do you have any questions before we get started? There's a back door. We're all here on time. I'll put it in an email. There's a back door coming in late. Okay, all right, cool. All right. Um, so we talked a little bit on Tuesday about economic growth, and economic growth being increases in standards of living, which we would measure as output per worker or output per person. Uh, the production possibilities frontier that we looked at on Tuesday captures those concepts of economic growth not by looking at living standards, that is not by looking at output per person, but by looking at just the total amount of output. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at a, uh, an approach that incorporates more equations, still has a graph, uh, is telling the same story, but in a more formal mathematical way. So the article by Gould and Ruffin, which is in your reader, uh, draws on some of this material to talk about economic growth. So when economists talk about economic growth, we use a model that was first proposed by Bob Solow, who received a Nobel Prize for this work. Uh, and what Solow suggested that we do is to try to think about the aggregate economy, the macro economy, all in one sort of thought or breath, uh, as we t traditionally do. And therefore, to think about the total amount of output in the economy, which is GDP, which we can shorthand with the uppercase Y, since income and output are always equal to each other, that the total amount of output in the economy, which we're using Y here to stand for, is produced with inputs. And we have some, way, some ways in which these inputs are combined for the economy as a whole to produce output. So it's kind of like a production function that we would use to talk about an individual firm. So when an individual firm is producing, say, uh, these um, writing tablets here that you have underneath your arm, they have a variety of inputs that they use in, in order to produce that output, which is the writing tablet. Um, they have some technology that they use to produce it. They have <coughs> knowledge that they use. They have perhaps some uh, state or national uh, guidelines they have to follow all of which combines to allow them to create output, the tablets, from inputs. With the aggregate production function, it's an analogous idea. It's just that instead of thinking about one particular type of output, we're going to think of all of the $15 trillion worth of things that are in goods and services at the same time. So we're thinking, gee, what does it take to produce $15 trillion worth of stuff in the United States economy in the year 2012? Well, it takes some inputs, and we're going to combine those inputs in some way, and that's going to allow us to produce output. So this function, the Y stands for the output, which is GDP. The K stands for capital. K stands for capital, and as you know, by like economists, by capital, we mean machines and buildings. So the quantity of machines and the quantity of buildings. And, ooh, goody. Um, so those machines and buildings, I'm trying to be real fancy this time with pictures and so include things that you are familiar with, like machine tools, such as you see here, but include also as tractors that we can see working outside. The first picture that I flew on by was uh, a plow. So here also is an example of, of capital, because that's both the horse and the, the farmer was on the plow. So we have lots of examples of capital. Um, question over here on the side. Investments, no. So investment is the purchases of new machinery and the construction of new buildings, which expands the amount of capital in the economy. So, so investment is how we change the amount of capital. Capital is the stock or the existing amount of machines and buildings. Okay, now let me see if I can do it. There we go. Good. So the K stands for capital, machines, and buildings, and we're thinking about this both historically, where we have good old-fashioned wooden plows, uh, and contemporary, contemporarily, where we have backhoes and so on. The L stands for labor, and the labor is people, whether those people are slave-free. So the man here is labor. He's a farmer. Uh, that's an example of labor. Or a farm family, right? So lots of families were participating in the farming activity in the 1800s, or today, people who are uh, farm workers uh, in the contemporary period. Child laborers that were used in the 1800s, or adult laborers, are part of labor when we talk about the L of labor. Slave labor is part of the L, which is labor. Uh, these are the Chinese workers who helped to build the railroad. So immigrant labor is part of labor, and of course, contemporarily. So labor includes not just people who are producing goods, but people who are producing services. Be that, for instance, health services uh, or retail uh, sorts of services. So capital, lots of types of capital are all included in that K. Labor, lots of types of workers, both people who are running their own farm or business uh, and those who are working for others, whether by choice or by force, are all included in, in the L, which is labor. The A in this equation, I want to get my pen going. The A in this equation captures everything that's not captured by the effects of the inputs, which are capital and labor. So these, the K and the L that we just looked at, those are the inputs to the production process. They're being used to produce the output, which we measure as GDP, which we capture with the uppercase Y. The A is called, has two different names. One is the solo residual. Remember, it was Bob Solow, name up here at the top, who came up with this model. And that solo residual was his way of saying, then we've got to somehow account for the fact that there are other things besides capital and labor that can change the amount of output that's being produced in the economy. So the leftover stuff that's not measured in K and not measured in L that also influences how much output is produced in the economy is captured in A. That's been formalized uh, since then. And so now we tend not to call it the solo residual, but to call it total factor productivity. Total factor productivity, sometimes called TFP for short. Total factor productivity is the exact same concept as the solo residual, it just doesn't have somebody's name attached to it. So again, this is language, right? When you're learning any profession, you have to learn the silly little language tricks that go into it. So total factor productivity, solo residual, two phrases, neither of which are terribly clear when you just look at them, that mean exactly the same thing. They both mean the things that influence how much output an economy can produce other than the inputs which we've already captured in the production function. So anything in this case other than K and L that can influence the amount of output that's produced. We take and we look at this, so far what we have is just the production function. We take and we can look at the production function graphically. So when we graph the production function, we do a little bit of a mathematical trick. The mathematical trick is that this way. There we go. Um, so long as we make some assumptions about the production function, in particular that its constant returns to scale, if we double all of the inputs, we get double the amount of output. If we triple all of the inputs, we get triple the amount of output. So with that little simplifying assumption, uh, this equation for the production function is equivalent to uh, output per worker is equal to that same A times some function of the capital labor ratio. 
It's just a little mathematical trick. Don't worry about why 100A you get to prove why it works. We're not going to prove it here. In 100B, you either prove it or use it. I don't know which. Um, I've taught 100B for a couple years now. Um, and it depends upon how much time you have in class whether you prove it or use it. We're just going to use it. It's a little trick we get to do. Uh, we get to divide by L on both sides, and we get output per worker. Y over L is some function of the capital labor ratio. I'm going to graph that. I'm going to put output per worker here on the vertical axis and capital per worker here on the horizontal axis. As we increase the amount of machines per worker, K over L, as we increase the amount of machines per worker, are we going to get more output or less output? With more machines per worker, we get more stuff or less stuff? More. So we know this is going to be some sort of an upward sloping line, because as we increase the amount of capital per labor measured on the horizontal axis, we're going to get more output per worker, which is measured on the horizontal axis. Every time we add one more machine without changing the number of workers, so we go from 10 machines per worker to 11 machines per worker to 12 machines per worker to 13 machines per worker, do we, every time we add one machine per worker, do we get the same increase in output per worker, yes or no? Because of what principle? Awesome. Because of the principle of diminishing marginal returns, as we add machines without changing the amount of workers, or so as we change that capital labor ratio, we, get, we do get increases in how much output we're producing, but the increases get smaller and smaller, which tells me that the graph I'm drawing is going to increase at a decreasing rate. Okay, so it's going to look like this. So we're going to have a graph that looks like that. Let me clean that up just a little bit. We know that if there is no capital per worker, we're going to get no output, so it's going to anchor itself down here at the origin. It's going to increase at a decreasing rate like this. I'll call that y over l, put parentheses around it, 1. So that's my, my first example. If there is a change in the amount of capital per worker, there's a change in k over l, are we going to move along that line, or is that line going to shift? Move along. If it's measured on one of the axes and it changes, we move along the graph. If it's not measured on one of the axes and it changes, the whole thing shifts. That's the general rule. So k over l is measured on the horizontal axis. If there's a change in the amount of capital per worker, that's going to move us along the existing production function, take us to a different point on that line. So a change in k over l moves us along. This graph is called the production function, I should say that. Aggregate production function. Suppose there's instead a change in A, that total factor of productivity or the solo residual. If there's a change in A, are we going to move along or shift? Shift. Is A measured on one of the axes? Yes or no? No. And that's how you know that we shift. Because A is not measured on one of the axes, therefore if we change the value of A, it's going to shift the whole function. If there is an increase in A, we're going to take and shift the entire production function up. So if there's an increase in A, it shifts up. Is that dark enough to show? Not really. So I'm going to draw a second production function here above the first one. I'll call it y over l, parentheses 2. And that corresponds to a different production function where there's a higher value of A, where the total factor of productivity or the solo residual has a greater value. And therefore, for any particular combination of capital to labor, just choose some value of k over l along your horizontal axis, call it k over l sub, or use a little a, just to give it a name. Uh, at the old level of total factor of productivity, the first line told us that we would have produced an amount of output y over l. Mm. I'll call it A1. I'm running out of labels here. Once the total factor of productivity, or solo residual, two names, same thing, once that value of A increases, we have a whole different production function. In effect, that first production function ceases to exist. So, for instance, this, once A increases, whoop, it's gone. That initial uh, production function ceases to exist. It's no longer there. And instead, that value K over L sub A will now produce a much greater amount of output. Dash it all the way up until you get to your second production function. Dash it over. And now that same amount of capital per worker is going to produce, I'll call it Y over L sub A2. One of the questions that we have to answer is where on this production function does the economy wind up? Does the economy wind up way down towards the origin with a very low level of capital per worker and therefore a very low level of output per worker? Does the economy wind up at a very high level, way off to the right, with a very high level of capital per worker, lots of machines per worker, and a very high level of output per worker that has high standards of living? The answer to where on this particular uh, aggregate production function, where on this line the economy lands, is one of the things that we focus on uh, in macro. I'm going to do a quick summary of what we spend quite some time on in a macro course and just sort of tell you. So the, where we wind up on this graph depends primarily upon what value of capital per labor, what value of K over L or machines per worker we wind up at. So where do we land? Where does the economy land in terms of the value of K over L? Because whatever the value of K over L is, dash it up, dash it over, there's your value of Y over L. So we really want to know what determines the level or the value of K over L. So K over L depends upon three things. K over L depends upon, first, depends upon the amount of saving in the economy. When we teach this in 100B, we talk about the saving rate because we're having to mathematically formalize this thing in order to do some calculus and play some games. We're not going to do that sort of formality here. Um, some of you just breathe the sigh of relief. So we're just going with the concepts. And what really matters is the amount of saving or the amount of saving relative to income. So we could say saving or we could say saving rate. We're getting the same idea. So how much is the economy saving? How much of the economy's resources are not being used to produce consumer goods and government goods? That's really what saving is all about. Saving is how many of our resources, we might think of saving as dollars in the bank. Saving is how many of our resources are we not using for producing things other than investment goods, other than machines and buildings. The more of our resources that we're using to produce, say, consumer goods, the fewer of our resources are available to produce investment goods, machines and buildings, and the smaller the capital stock per worker will be. So flip all that inside out and around backwards, and what do we get? That an increase in the amount of saving in the economy, all else constant, an increase in the amount of saving in the economy will increase the amount of investment spending. Remember, investment spending is businesses purchases of machinery, construction of new buildings, and right now we don't care about the inventory changes because that's really about cyclical fluctuations and not about long-term growth. So investment is machinery, purchases of machinery, and construction of buildings. When there is more saving in the economy, there are fewer resources that are being used to produce consumer goods and other similar types of items, more resources available to produce investment goods, and for reasons that we proved to you in 100B, and I want you to just accept right now, that's going to lead in the long run to an increase in the amount of investment in the economy, more purchases of machines and buildings. That's to increase the quantity of capital so we have more machines and more buildings which means that we're going to have all else constant a higher capital labor ratio more machines per worker as a result of the fact we have more machines so that's the first three things i said the first one was saving the more we save that is the fewer of our resources we use to produce consumer goods and like things the higher our investment the higher our capital per labor ratio the higher our standard of living does that work in the short run if people start saving now is it going to increase standards of living in 2013 
No. So this is one of those wonderful little paradoxes of economics, right? That the more saving there is, that's beneficial in the long run because it allows the reallocation of resources from consumption to investment, allows for more capital per worker, allows those workers to be more productive, increases standards of living. But that ha- that's a long run story, decade to decade, generation to generation. It's not a short run story. If people were to increase their saving right now in 2013, what would happen to the average income in the economy? It would go down. That's right. If people increase their saving right now, they're spending less on currently produced goods and services. Fewer people have jobs. Fewer people have incomes. The average income in the economy goes down. So that's one of those paradoxes of economics. But remember, here in history, at least until we get to the Great Depression stuff, we're focused on long-run growth. We're not focused on those short-run fluctuations. So we get saving. That was the first of three. The second thing that matters in terms of determining the value of K over L is labor force growth rate. How quickly is the labor force increasing from year to year? So I can write this as a percentage change in L. It's the change in the labor force over time. Labor force changes either because there's an increase in the population, and the same share of the population is going into the labor force, greater population, greater labor force, or labor force increases because of an increase in labor force participation rates. So you have the same population, but a greater share of that population is working. Either of those forces, an increase in population or an increase in labor force participation growth, either of those things can increase the growth rate of the labor force. The faster the labor force is growing, all else constant, if your labor force is growing, say, 5% per year instead of 1% per year, you've got a labor force that's growing faster, 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 faster. The number of machines is growing, but no faster when we have a 5% labor force growth than when we had a 1% labor force growth. And so our capital to labor, our machine per worker ratio, is going to go down. So an increase in the rate at which the labor force is growing, so a labor force is growing at, say, 5% per year instead of 1% per year, means that ever larger labor force has to share some number of machines. More and more people sharing, say, a constant number of machines means fewer machines per worker. So the increase in the labor force growth rate is going to decrease the capital labor ratio. The third thing that matters is the quality of the machines, quality of capital. Quality of capital, we capture that by talking about how long does a typical machine last. Does a machine have a life length of two years, of five years, of 10 years, of 20 years? It doesn't really matter why the life of the machine ends, whether it ends through obsolescence or whether it ends because the thing is just a piece of junk and it falls apart. What matters is, does the machine last for two years or five years or 10 years or 20 years? The longer a machine lasts, all else constant, the longer a machine lasts, the more machines there will be per worker. The longer the machines last, the more machines there will be per worker. So the, the better the machine, where I'm gonna put better in quotes, where better means longer lasting, doesn't mean prettier, faster. It means how long it lasts. So the longer lasting the machine, the higher the capital labor ratio. We capture that with the depreciation rate. The depreciation rate is inversely related to how long a machine lasts. So a very long lasting machine has a very low depreciation rate. A short lived machine has a high depreciation rate. So the lower the depreciation rate, the lower the depreciation rate, that is the longer the machine lasts, the higher is the capital labor ratio. So a third thing that matters, living standards, we have the saving rate, we have the labor force growth rate, and the third thing that matters is the quality of capital. If we're building plows that are made out of wood versus say plows that are made out of steel, you think there's any difference between the quality of those two types of plows? Which one's gonna give you a higher living standard? Uh, steel or wood? Steel, it's gonna last longer, that's right. If we're paving our roads, if we're taking dirt roads back east where, oh my God, is it cold today, um, and where it snows and all sorts of other nasty things that we don't have to experience here, and we're paving those roads with wood as opposed to paving those roads with, say, asphalt, which roads are going to last longer, asphalt or wood? Asphalt. Wood has a tendency to rot. Snow on the wood, rain on the wood, melt the snow on the wood, wood's gone after a season. So the quality of capital influences, that is how long the capital lasts, influences the standards of living. The other piece that matters to the standard of living is not just the value of K over L, but the value of A matters too. So how rapidly that total factor productivity is growing is the last piece that determines what's happening to our standards of living. The faster A is increasing, the faster standards of living are going up. A, remember from Tuesday, incorporates all sorts of things. A lot of people think of technology, but it also incorporates things like educational attainment, uh, financial institutions, and the quality of our financial institutions, because it's the financial institutions that channel the funds from the savers to the investors. Uh, What else was on that list? Um, Property rights was on that list. Judicial systems were on the list. Communications networks, uh, transportation networks. I may have forgotten one, but there was a long list at the end of Tuesday. All of that stuff is in A, and the rate at which that total factor productivity grows determines the rate at which standards of living grow, which gets back to tables one and two that we looked at on Tuesday. This is all based on the solo model, the way that Bob Solo presented it, where he had two inputs, capital and labor. Having two inputs makes a lot of sense if you're trying to come up with a description of a post-World War II world. But we're going to start our story 14,000 years ago. And so we need some inputs beyond just capital and labor. Is that a question or just hold me up? Okay. So we need some inputs beyond just capital and labor. We need agriculture too. So we need to incorporate not just capital and labor, but land as well. And we use T to stand for land, T as in Terra, as in Terra Haute, Haute, Terra Haute, Michigan. T as in, I'll think about it tomorrow at Terra. So T, as in Terra, is our shorthand for land. And what we can do with our little assumption about constant returns to scale is we can say that therefore output per worker is some constant A times some function of the capital labor ratio and the land to labor ratio. So that what we care about is not just increases. Now it's hard to graph, right? Because now I have to start graphing in three dimensions, which I can't do. But if I could, I'd have K over L on one axis and T over L on another axis and Y over L on a third axis. I can't do that, but you might. But land matters, and that means that land policy matters. When we're looking at United States economic history, we have to think about land, and we have to think about land policy. So we have to think about the fa- things that change the amount of land per worker. That's going to be not simply acquisition, which we'll talk about on Tuesday. It's also going to be changes in the cultivation of land. So how many acres were, were usable? Uh, how many, how many um, 